So uh, just before we go to our last speaker, I need to remind you that there are evaluation forms in the back of the plastic envelope that you've got there. I think it's the last page, Jen, is that right? Um, so um, if you could please fill those in so that uh, we know how to improve things for future meetings. So our final speaker is uh, Rachel Thompson. Rachel, of course, uh, for those of you who live in Hobart, know very well as manager of infection control here at Royal Hobart. She's been uh, previously president of uh, the Tasmanian Infection Control Association and past president of ACA before it changed its name. And she's going to talk to us about clinical simulation education. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, good afternoon. I actually had good morning on my presentation and then they didn't tell me that I was the last speaker. So I'd just like to say I actually think it's a conspiracy because for those of you who attended this workshop last year, um, I was the last speaker last year. Um, the challenge with that is that everybody wants to go, we're running over time, but also following on from such exceptional speakers um, and I know that Lindsay and the team will thank the other speakers but personally I have found the presentations this morning um, just remarkable, rewarding, and have given me a lot of food for thought to follow up on, so thank you. Um, I just also want to now go back to the first session. Jenny talked this morning, the beginning of the day, about some of the challenges and uh, just providing that sort of analysis of what people are doing in their programs. And one of the things she identified is that um, people are not using clinical simulation very much. And I think I wrote down the figure that about 33% of people actually use it. Um, and a lot of people actually said one of the reasons they don't use it is that it's resource intensive. So I've been asked if I'd actually talk about our approach to clinical simulation and I hope that in doing that, that you will see that in fact for us, using clinical simulation has become very not resource intensive and it's something that um, is working really well we think for us. So without further ado, I'll keep going. Um, I'm going to throw my papers around the room while I'm going. Um, okay, so I'm going to actually talk about, if, for in our organisation, the impact of, of clinical simulation and, and the difference that we think it's made. In particular, I guess, the things that I think are important are translating you know, that knowledge to practice, but also sustainability, and they're the two things that we've talked a lot about this morning. Who are we? Well, I think those of you mostly know where we are. If you've come to Hobart, you should know where you are. Um, the Royal Hobart Hospital, for those of you who don't know Tasmania very well, is literally minutes from this very centre. We're just behind where I am now, up the road. Uh, welcome to Hobart. Um, and we are the tertiary referral centre for Tasmania. And we have the full range of services that you would expect a hospital of our size and nature to have. The hand hygiene program in our organisation, like many of you, was rolled out in the middle of 2009, of course with the exception of Victoria who rolled it out considerably earlier, and we had a full-time clinical nurse consultant position, a project position that was allocated to rolling out hand hygiene in our own organisation. In 2011, the hand hygiene program came back into infection control unit, minus the resources. Um, we then established a hand hygiene portfolio and put that into bed with the other um, established portfolios that we had within our team. When the hand hygiene um, program returned into, inf into our service, into infection control, um, we actually had a lot of strategies in place for us. So the project officer had developed a lot of strategies that were well embedded in our organisation. And we continue to actually take those forward. Uh, we used exactly the same things. In particular, they included things like the intensive care staff, so um, hand hygiene auditors from my team uh, would actually go down to clinical units and services, and when they were about to be audited, we would actually go and provide some on-the-ground intensive education to make sure that they could do the things we wanted to, so that when we went to audit, we would hopefully see improvements, but, you know, we were trying to help people. At that point, we were still inviting people to our party, you know party wasn't on, they were in it, we were inviting them. So we would go and actually do a presentation for them. At the end of the audit period, intensive care nurses would then go, intensive infection control nurses, so is my background, would then go back into the units and our infection control team would then give a follow-up presentation. So we had before auditing and after auditing, telling people what we want them to do and how they had actually gone. We actually wanted units though 
to start to take greater ownership. We recognised that it was not going to be sustainable for the infection control nurses to keep on holding people's hands, to keep on delivering education, to want them to come and join in. So we had to think about what we were going to do. I might actually just step back a little bit here. So we actually developed action plans, and the action plans that we developed, they were really unsophisticated. I don't know how you guys go with your action plans, but we gave people a blank piece of paper that effectively along the top said, what are the problems, what are you going to do about it, and who's going to do something? The truth is that half the time the action plans weren't completed at all, and if they were completed, they usually involved infection control nurses coming in to do something extra for them. So let's have a little look at how our hospital was actually tracking. I've put how we were tracking in red because I think it shows you that we weren't tracking very well. I told you that we'd rolled out the hand hygiene program at the Royal Hobart Hospital in 2009. But if you look at this graph, you'll see that by the end of audit period two in 2012, we were still to break through the 70% target on even one single occasion. It wasn't a great place to be. I flagged that the, that the um, program returned to our service at the beginning of 2011, and you could argue that there was a small improvement. But in reality, was that just natural development? Perhaps so. So what were we going to do? Of course, you can imagine in our own service, we were feeling very disheartened because we were hearing already grumblings of the 70% target going to be increased. And Victoria have already led the way. They're already over 80%. Everybody's over 80%. Uh, we asked ourselves, well, we're not doing enough. Then we asked ourselves, were we doing too much? Of course, the executives were very keen that we actually lead some improvement. So it led us to really sit down and think about what we could do. We decided we couldn't do any more. What we needed was for the organisation to actually start to own hand hygiene. And so clinical simulation was something that we began to explore. And it was the very first, I'd say, of the different strategies that we actually implemented. What we did was we identified which was the lead of the laggards, <laughs> which was the worst performing ward of all. Um, and we had a ward, and I'll show you their compliance in a moment, but they were, it was not the emergency department because at that point we were not actually auditing in our emergency department. We now are, oh joy. Um, but we actually identified at that time an inpatient unit that were actually a very much an underperformer. And we implemented a collaborative project between the infection control nurses, between clinical nurse educators on that service or allocated to that service, and ward staff, people were, who were, had an interest um, in infection control. And we developed clinical scenarios. We actually came up with a few ideas so that people could see what we were trying to get at. We came up with things that we thought were, were typical and common for, that most nursing staff would actually undertake. With the project, we then also identified some very unit-specific procedures for that clinical area. And again, coming back to the comment around clinical context and the importance of clinical context, we made sure that we were working towards that. And we then started a trial um, on the target ward using these clinical simulations, or should I say, they were clinical scenarios, but we brought them to life through clinical simulation. We would go to the ward, we would actually take over an empty room, we would actually sometimes have a member of staff hop into a bed, and we would actually work through the clinical scenario. So how did we go? Well, this actually shows you our target ward. So we, act we started this activity in 2011, and I will come back and give you an update on how things are tracking. But when we started, you can see that before we implemented our clinical scenario, compliance on that unit was 56%. You may recall that the hospital compliance was tracking at around about 60 odd percent. The, we then commenced the process of um, the clinical si simulations and we re-audited during the time that we were actually running them. And we detected, yeah, in fact, a reasonable increase. You might say yes, because everyone's interested in talking about it, so that was a good thing. But we still hadn't hit 70%. We then continued the clinical simulations and had the ward staff delivering those simulations. So we assisted them, we worked with them, we ran the first few, but increasingly the unit actually started to take them on. The focus was very much on the five moments, 
but breaking down clinical commonplace, as I said, clinical situations, so that the staff would then begin to hopefully link the moments with their clinical work. So after we had actually run and been through, in fact, most staff, night duty, weekends, all staff on the ward, we'd improved a lot, but we were still at only 67%. Something happened. 12 months later, we had finally got up to, and in fact, increased by more than 10% again. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you, we made a really important change in how we, run in how we ran our clinical simulations. So we developed them, we had the ward start to run them, but we made another really important change. The important change for us was that we actually decided that we had to move away from focusing on the five moments. And it's really pleasing to hear that we are talking about that more openly. And I think it's something that many hospitals have already, and I know other people in the room today, have already started to do work in that area. But it was something that we identified a number of years ago and very deliberately built into our training strategies. We also made sure that we kept our eye on clinical context and we developed clinical simulations and scenarios so that people would actually see that hand hygiene was relevant in all areas, in all kinds of work, and that you could bring it to life. Uh, we have, just as a matter of interest, and for anybody who might have an interest in contacting me after um, today's session, we have developed, um, I would say now, over 12 different um, individual clinical scenarios, including not only things like giving IV antibiotics, routine oral ad drug administration, uh, venipuncture, um, mobilising a patient with an IDC, uh, commencing a patient on dialysis, removing pacing wires. We've, we've gone through a lot of different areas. So if you are interested in contacting uh, my organisation after today's session, we would very happily share with you some of our clinical simulations. So just to show you what our clinical simulations actually look like. We have for the person who's running the simulation um, a worksheet where we've broken down into the simplest steps possible a, a, a typical work that people would actually do. And we've named it up. So this one is giving an intravenous antibiotic. For the person who's running the simulation, they don't have to be a hand hygiene auditor. We actually give them the answers so that they're guided, so that they can actually step people through the simulation. As I said, when we first started this, and all of the participants, the people who come along from the ward, they're given a blank sheet. What we used to ask staff to do is, as we went through a particular area on the scenario, on the simulation, we would ask them to preemptively decide if the staff had to do hand hygiene, but importantly, we would ask them to name the moment. We now don't. All we ask them to do is to tell us, is this an opportunity for hand hygiene? Yes or no. We have a facilitated discussion uh, where, we, where we do talk about, for example, why it is or why it isn't, because we will find that there is a range of answers. People will put yes, people will put no. They can't put not applicable. They have to choose yes or no. And we talk about why it is that it is a moment for hand hygiene. Because we keep the moments here, we're allowing the facilitator to comment on and say, Yes, we do. Look, for those of you who might be interested, of course, that's your moment one before you touch the patient. So we're allowing people to helpfully make that transitional link between theoretical knowledge online to clinical practice. So we've now made a decision also that seeing as clinical staff are running the simulations, we, in infection control, we no longer run the simulations. They are totally run by other people. We've also got them because of, if you just go back to this slide, basically the fairly short, simplistic nature of them, breaking them into little bites. Uh, we've had it so that they can be run in 15 minutes or less. So a simulation can be run by a ward nurse who's not a hand hygiene auditor in 15 minutes or less. So we think that's really helped with our sustainability strategies. But the other thing we decided to do was get away from those terrible action plans that I mentioned that no one was ever filling in, and we actually developed for them hand hygiene compliance improvement frameworks. Now, some of you may have seen these last year, may remember that we did mention these. I just want to highlight for you a couple of things that we've done. So these are available online. They're available all the time on our infection control website, intranet website. We also do deliberately distribute them to areas 
um, across the hospital. When we introduced them, uh, they were given to all areas, but we make sure when an area underperforms that they are aware of the resources that are there for them. And built in so that when staff actually have that document, they just have to click. These documents are actually embedded. We have examples of common clinical simulations. The sheet that tells them how to actually run the simulation and links to other useful or important websites. So I said I'd come back and tell you how our target ward was going. So our target ward here, you may remember they finally got to 76%. They all went, thank goodness, we forgot about it for a while. <laughs> Interestingly here, in audit period one of 2014, I will let you know that they decide, because they were so disappointed that their compliance had dropped to just 70%, that um, as we were just hearing a moment ago, that if you can perhaps link bare below the elbows to your hand hygiene improvement strategies, they actually launched bare below the elbows and ran mandatory simulations again across the period and their compliance went up to 84%. It goes to show that things build on each other. We haven't kept it just to nursing. Uh, we haven't been brave enough to beard our anaesthetists. We have, however, um, gone out into the allied health space. We now run an annual mandatory um, simulation, um, and it's not mandatory by us, it was mandated by the head of the Allied Health Service. Um, all of our physiotherapists in particular attend a manual simulation workshop, which we do actually run that one. Um, and before we introduced simulation for our Allied Health, their compliance was sitting around about 60%. Since that time, we've actually seen at least some improvements and I think we can do more. Uh, we'd probably like to think of them taking ownership and running more simulations themselves. The hospital, how's the hospital gone? Well, in our hospital, I told you, we were struggling, executive were on our case. But since the implementation, we actually, of our um, simulations, we did start to match and we have now maintained. So for the, that for the last five audit periods, we've actually had compliance exceeding 70, and I'm glad to say exceeding 75%. So, I've discussed, I guess, just one core program element that we use at the Royal Hobart Hospital, and how we really feel that it's helped us to improve hand hygiene compliance. Our program has been multifaceted. Uh, we have made sure that we've contextualized the work that we do, and it's not just one element of that, of that particular program that's brought about success. And yes, we have met challenges. Overall, our rates have improved. And importantly for us, staff are increasingly owning hand hygiene compliance outcomes and strategies, strategies to actually lead improvement. And we are consistently working with our staff. Um, I'd just like to have a couple of acknowledgements in closing. And that is that this program has been made possible through the consistent efforts of my entire team. But in particular, I would actually like to acknowledge my colleague, Brenda Thomas, who is here in the audience today, um, at the table behind me. Brenda, put your hand up. Brenda, for those of you who haven't met Brenda, she's an amazing resource, um, and I encourage you to speak to her across the next few days. Um, so thank you very much. Questions for Rachel? So the different so you've gone through each of these um, sort of, say like putting in the IV and you, you just talk, so how many of those have you got now? Not, how many have you got now? Um, we have over 12, I think, oh, Brenda, you might be able to tell me more explicitly, but I think it's over 12 different clinical simulations that we have. Yeah, so 12 to 14 different simulations um, and not all of them just for nursing. We actually have developed a suite for allied health. Okay, well, thank thanks you. very much. Thank you. Rachel, we promise not to put you on as last speaker if you're speaking next year. <laughs> uh, okay, well, look, uh, thank you to everyone. I think, um, you know, we've had just under three hours. It's been a pretty intense three hours, I think, and um, I hope all of you agree that we've covered a wide range of topics, both from kind of updating about where we're at um, from the Hand Hygiene Australia point of view, some of the new initiatives we're hoping to bring in and uh, you're getting kind of the heads up on that before they're actually introduced. But also importantly, like anything else, uh, you know, you can't um, 
deal with a problem unless you admit you've got a problem. And I think that what we've had today is we've tried to highlight some of those areas that you know, we all think we all know are problem areas and that we could do a bit better. And I think we've heard some really innovative uh, new approaches and suggestions. They won't be the total answer, but they're going to be, be an important start to finding uh, a solution to this. So I hope you've uh, all enjoyed your workshop. Please make sure you fill in your evaluation forms and uh, leave, just leave them on the tables there and we'll come around and collect them. Uh, I want a special thank you though to all the various speakers who've talked today. And if any of you'd like to stay back and uh, pick their brains or ask them any questions, uh, please feel free to do so. Enjoy the rest of the conference here in beautiful Hobart. Thanks very much.